have uh, copies of our prospectus that we'd like you to take home with you and to share with people that you may know can benefit from com coming to study at Cornerstone. So once again, thank you for being here. And we've got a very exciting program uh, lined up for you with uh, really esteemed speakers, panelists, and an absolutely outstanding, if I may say so, um, facilitator, Dr. Sharon Johnson. I say that because she's a member of staff here at Cornerstone. And uh, she has a huge and has continued to make uh, a huge contribution to not only education, but uh, psychology in education, if I can put it that way. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Sharon, PhD, completed her psychology research at Stellenbosch University, focusing on the stress and burnout of teachers in high-risk schools. Her postdoctoral fellowship was at a youth care and education center on the Cape Flats, where she was sent by the Western Cape Education Department to research the well-being of educators in traumatic contexts of the Cape Flats ganglions. Sharon has numerous papers published in peer-reviewed journals on her research in schools. She has several chapters in academic books in the USA and Europe, and is writing her own books on the restorative care of vulnerable youth in state care and trauma healing in schools. Sharon lectures in the psychology faculty of Cornerstone, but she also runs her own counseling practice and consults to NGOs and government departments. Before I invite Sharon onto the stage, I'd like to celebrate this moment with a publication, forthcoming publication, that, uh, that a, a chapter in which uh, Sharon's work will appear very soon. She'll tell you a bit more about it. Many of you have grabbed the flyer called Lessons in Care, Triumph over Trauma and Tribulation. Um, in this past week, an op-ed was published in the Cape Argus, where Sharon wrote very insightfully about the situation with regard to the need for care in our schools. Immediately after this event, Sharon will be seated at the back, and I'm really encouraging you to speak to her about her book, um, about her work, and also to pre-order the book. And we've got a nice gift to give each one of you who do that this evening, and that is that you will get a 20% discount if you pre-order the book this evening. Um, and include your name on the list that Sharon will be keeping uh, in terms of uh, creating an opportunity for you to get uh, what would generally be quite an expensive publication, but uh, well worth having in your collection. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Sharon Johnson. Good day, everyone. I think I have my own mic, so I don't have to speak in there. Um, thank you for that very illustrious introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here chairing this um, committee of people with loads of experience in, the, in education in South Africa. And I'm sure if I had to add up all the combined years of the audience, I'm sure many of you have also a lot of experience to contribute towards this discussion and please ask questions afterwards after we've all done our presentations. So I'm going to start very briefly just to expand a little bit on my work for the Department of Education. At the moment I am working in schools, I'm seeing about 100 teachers a week introducing the, the concept of circles of care which is um, the idea that teachers can sit in circles and discuss their problems and have a more caring approach in the schools to their difficulties. And I'm developing, because there's nothing like it 
currently in psychology a teacher trauma tool, which means that teachers can have a protocol on their desks which says if a child comes up and has been traumatized, this is what you need to do because at the moment they have absolutely no idea. So my training in the schools at the moment is to distinguish between crisis and trauma, which a crisis is a more ongoing event, which isn't of a huge magnitude, but the trauma can re be relating back to child sexual abuse, the exposure to violence, and what do we do about that? Because I think the challenge for all of us is that we can't learn if we are in the survival brain. Those of you who know anything about the brain know that if we are in the survival brain, um, which is this part of the brain, it's a model has been developed in psychology, if you're in that part of the brain, you can't think straight and you can't open your book and actually learn. So all the efforts that we're making to empower teachers to be effective teachers goes to naught when the children can't think straight, that they are in their survival brain. So with the survival brain comes the emotional brain and the amygdala and the fear center, and then only after that do we get the cognitive thinking brain. And I'm sure you've heard of the expression that somebody flips their lid, and that means that you're out of your cognitive brain and you're into your emotional and physical aspects of your body, and the children that are disrupting classes are in this part of their brains. And the teachers, when I say to them, are your children traumatized? They say, no, they're naughty. So it's like they don't have an understanding of why the children are coming and being naughty. They're being traumatized. And when I, when I was at the youth care center, those problems were exacerbated because this care center, which I have written my book on, those children had dropped out of the system. They, many of them were illiterate. They were coming from abuse and neglected backgrounds. There were difficulties of going into gangs. And what do we do with them? You know, the teachers can perhaps send a, a child out of their class and even out of their school. But the buck actually ended here. And we had to find a formula to work with these children because there was nowhere else to send them. And basically what happened at the youth care center was I taught the teachers that these children were little geniuses that they had survived extreme conditions of trauma and they were still standing. And the fact that they would come into the class and jump out of a window or not be able to even sit in a chair meant that that was the adaptive process to survive and how are we now going to engage with that. So the lessons of care in my book, it's not an easy book to have written because we are working with the extreme behaviors of these children. But I think there are lessons for all of us in more mainstream schools that we don't want the children to end up in that youth care center. We want them to stay in the system, to get some kind of qualification, to be able to go out and be functioning adults in a civil society. So that is our challenge, I think, here today. The, the state of education in South Africa is that there is a lot of trauma in the schools. In, when I was in, in, I'm working at two schools in Mannenberg at the moment, and the bullets are flying outside the window while I'm in that classroom. So I'm in the trenches with those teachers. And I said to them, can any of you focus on what I'm saying? And they said, no. So we're well, welcome to the world of the, the, the learners. So I believe that a, a big focus in education in South Africa is to try and heal the traumatized children, to give the educators the skills with the teacher trauma tool, which is on their desk, together with the psychological first aid, which we want to use with the crisis that is also going on, and to start equipping them. And they might say, well, I don't want to become a psychologist. I'm already a teacher. I'm a nurse. I'm a doctor. I'm, a, I'm everything else. I'm a parent. Do I have to now become a psychologist? And I say to them, I'm not teaching you to become a psychologist. I'm just giving you some basic human-to-human -human interaction skills that can ensure that we do no more harm in our classrooms. Because if you are hitting, which corporal punishment is no longer obviously um, in place, it's been replaced with shouting. The same part of the brain lights up whether you are hitting a child or shouting at a child. So we have no effective discipline measures. But if we start to consider to care for the children, I say to the teachers, how many of you say that you love your children? And they all look at me and one guy says, well, I said that about five years ago and the children just laughed at me. 
So, okay, it's going to be tough. They're not used to care. Another thing that I try to teach the teachers is to have positive interaction between the learners, positive touch. Although ethically, obviously, teachers are not meant to touch learners. But can we do high fives or an elbow touch or a fist touch that learners start to actually touch each other and to learn safe touch from the, from each other and from the teacher? And I challenged the, teacher, the educators and said, go into the classroom and ask the, the learners to give each other a positive stroke, what we call in transactional analysis. And they came back the next day because I'm working over four weeks in each school. And they said, no, well, that didn't work. So I said, well, what do you mean? They didn't understand what a compliment was. They couldn't turn to the child next to them and say something that was positive because they never heard anything positive themselves. So the teacher actually had to try and teach what a positive affirmation is in the classroom because that was an unknown concept. So we have a lot of social ills out there where the children are in very poor social conditions and they are coming to schools ill-equipped to cope with what is required of them. But there's been research undertaken in, on the Cape Flats in South Africa saying that 60% of the performance of the child is their environment and their parents and their intellectual ability. 30% of that performance is the teacher what they give to those learners, and 10% is the school. So out of 100%, we have got, what have we got? 40% of what we can do in schools to help those learners. So the teachers are sometimes quite amazed by that statistic, that they have such a powerful influence. And I'm sure you've heard the, the fact that it only takes one positive influence in the life of a child to turn their life around. They only need to have one person that can inspire and direct them. So my job is to go into schools and inspire teachers who are feeling burnt out. When I started my research, the burnout levels were 65% in general schools. That has now risen to 80%. When I ask teachers, do you feel burnt out, which is emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a feeling of unmet needs, which interestingly enough has just been classified as a mental disorder. Before the doctors, if you went and said, I've got burnt out, they didn't consider you to be sick. But it has re relegated itself to actually you, you need time off, you have problems. And it's that lack of empathy when you are physically exhausted and emotionally exhausted that you cannot actually interact with these harmed, with these traumatized learners who need the empathy. So we need to start with the, the inward healing of the teachers that they can feel more capable of helping the learners. We need to start Im helping learners to, uh, to be no more traumatized in the classroom than the other trauma that they've had in their communities. And then I think as a society, we need to start embracing these teachers and recognizing the difficulties that they are having and the challenges out there and seeing how we can create more caring communities. Because clearly sending in the army and the police is just meeting violence with violence. And that is not the answer. So um, that is just a small glimpse of my work in the schools. And um, I'm hoping by the beginning of next year to write my second book, which will be on the teacher trauma tool, to investigate how we can create safety in schools where safety is not an obvious element. Safety in the body, safety in the emotions, and safety in the mind, not only for the learners, but also the teachers. That is the essence of, of helping our classrooms as far as I'm concerned. So that's enough from me. We can talk a little bit further and you can ask questions if you like. But I'd like to introduce John Volmick, who is um, one of our, our next esteemed guests and speaker. And he's going to introduce, give a more broader picture of the state of education in South Africa, which is the title of this um, dialogue. So John has served for four years from 2006 to 2010 as the chairperson of Umaluzi Council and he's serving a third term as chair of council. In 200, 2016 he served as interim vice chancellor of the Durban University of Technology and he was the acting vice principal 
uh, sorry, Acting Vice Chancellor at CEPUT in 2017. He currently serves as the president of Cornerstone Institute. So would you like to welcome John up, please? Good afternoon. <clears throat> I am um, very honored to be here. And as my custom is, <clears throat> I didn't come here to, to lecture to you. So we are here to exchange views. I believe that uh, always I remind myself, none of us are as smart as all of us. So. I think uh, this applies to today as well. There's a couple of things I want to say by way of introduction. Firstly, education in a democracy is complex. And when we deal with complexity, we have to accept that there may not be a solution, one singular solution. However, there are always choices. So instead of trying to find solutions, that's the time we fight with each other. Because this one believes that their little way of doing things is the only way, and somebody else believes the opposite. So what we need to do is, in order to make the right choices, we need to engage openly and honestly with the situation. When you do that, you identify the core issues. Once you understand these are the 10 core issues, you can say, given where I am, I can do number two and number six and number eight. That's it. Somebody else can do the others. And that's the way we can work together. So, um, you know, nobody likes to work with complexity. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, I'll see how it goes. Uh, we all like to work with simplicity, but, <coughs> You know, if you, if you take into account that there are two kinds of simplicity. So given the complexity of education, if you want simplicity, you can't do it at the near side of complexity. You have to engage with the complexity so that you get on the far side. So this side I call simplistic. And if you ever wanted to see something that was simplistic, it was apartheid. It never engaged with the complexity of this country. So it came up with a few stupid laws that were never sustainable. It was simplistic. Anyway, Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, uh, said that good leaders have the courage to face brutal facts. You, you look the facts in the face. Don't try and find excuses for it, you confront it. Those are the facts, whether it's personal or collective. Now, unfortunately, we live in a country where people seem to believe that it is better to be negative than to be positive. Now, once you, once you believe that, we replace brutal facts with brutal myths, and we embrace these things as if they are facts. And education is replete with those examples. Just yesterday, I was reading some article about the grade nine debacle. And I won't mention the author just in case she's in the audience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, here's an example. Uh, in, the, in the article, she says, um, South Africa in, is last in math education in the world. Now, you know how many countries there are in the world? And only 40, 40 countries participate in those studies at any one time. And even if we are number 40, which we're not, it uh, doesn't mean we 
the bottom of the world. <laughs> yeah? So it's that kind of national psyche that we need to change. So let me quickly go um, through some challenges. OK, I've got some challenges up here. The first, as you can see, the basic problem is that we are a high cost and a low performing education system. That's a fact. I've just come back from Ethiopia. And um, you know, if you want to know how many kids should be at school, you take a quarter of the population. So we have 50 million, so 50 odd. So we've got 12 to 13 million kids at school. So that's about right, about right. Ethiopia has 110 million. And therefore, they have 30 million people at school. And by the way, just in case I forget, um, only 6% of those learners go to high school. Only 6%. And they're quite happy with that. And I'll come back to that later. So I want to say uh, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what have we achieved in the last 25 years? That, to me, is very important. And you may say, well, 25 years is not long enough, given the devastating legacy of apartheid. But this week, I was sitting, lost in admiration, at the celebration, the 70th uh, celebration of the People's Republic of China. And I sat there and realized that when they established, that when they founded the People's Republic of China in 1949, we had a nationalist government here. So it's 70 years and 70 years. And so if you look at what happened there, and I'm not going to belabor the point because I have very limited time uh, to get through what I want to say is that the first 30 years of those 70 years in China, nothing happened. They had undergone extreme difficulties, including famine and all kinds of other poverty problems. Yet, after Mao died, after the period of struggle, they focused on getting the education system right. So for the last 40 years, China, focused on that. They then opened up the economy. They joined the World Trade Organization. And today, as we speak, China, the People's Republic of China, is arguably one or two, number one or number two, economic power in the world in 40 years. Now, we've been going for 25 years. So we have to ask ourselves, OK, well, maybe I should just, to be fair, say, Let's go back to 1949. So we had uh, the 1953 uh, Bantu Education Act. And uh, that act uh, was not meant to build. It was meant to destroy the education system that were run by, by the provinces and by missionaries and so on. And it, it wanted to bring black education under direct state control. And I, I can go on and talk about that. Driven by the Africana nationalist ideology. Now, that was part of a bigger strategy. Of course, we know that by 1960s, the Colored uh, Persons Education Act was introduced. And 1963, the Indian Education Act of 1965. Yeah. And then came the Soweto uprising. Then came the mass democratic movement, which saw the last vestiges of apartheid education as we entered the democratic era. And so, you know, when I was, I, I was more or less born just after apartheid. So I grew up in that period. And when I was 25, we had the Soweto uprising. And the point that I want to make, like China, the nationalists, as, as destructive as it was, apartheid education needed only 30 years to complete its project. 30 years. And I'm not 
applauding that. I'm just simply saying, how did they do that? And so we've been going for 25 years. What have we achieved? And that's a state of education that we want to talk about. But I, uh, you will tell me when my 15 minutes are up. Uh, it's, it's up. <laughs> it's up. Uh, but, you know, all we've been doing is celebrating the chaos of a new beginning. Yeah. And so we've been generating all kinds of papers, green papers, turning to white papers, and policy papers. And the, the conventional signposts were washed away, and we were uncharted, uncharted waters. And so, uh, with your permission, I just want to show uh, the one uh, Nick Spall slide, which I like, uh, which is the, the second point, and, and I'll stop with that, because the others are, are fairly obvious. But this one, uh, it's got to do with the two education realities. You see the education for the 20% at the top and the 80% at the bottom. And the idea is always uh, mooted that you can get people from this bottom to participate in the 10% of high economic activity. I think that clearly, if, if I had the time to talk about school dropout and so on, and maybe in question time I can still do that. You will notice that um, it's been highly unsuccessful, that model. To, yeah, I, I don't believe in that model anymore. Uh, I, don't think, I think we're misleading people by making them believe that we can get everybody, this 80%, to participate at the top. And I've been engaging with people at UWC around this issue. And, <clears throat> and I think that uh, one of the thoughts that come out of those discussions that I'm having is that we should prepare our learners to participate in the second or informal economy, not only in the first economy, which is that part at the top. And the argument is that the first economy, the formal economy, has not created any significant jobs in the past 20 years. It has created shareholder value uh, for for whites and for a few blacks, elite. And uh, that came at the expense of the greater common good. So instead of thinking in terms of economic transformation, our education system needs some readjustment so that instead of uh, economic uh, transformation, we talk about economic integration. And that simply means uh, we take the expertise of the formal economy and connect that with the know-how in the informal economy. And the, so we can co-create uh, and co-create between the two worlds sustainable solutions for poverty and inequality and unemployment at the point where it exists and, and not try and find relief in that top 10%. That Maybe a controversial, but I've become convinced over time that we need to do that. And I think our TVET colleges and even the grade nine um, exit point, which I'm sure you would like to hear my views on, uh, uh, it can help in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There will, there will be time for you to ask John some questions afterwards when we've listened to all the speakers. So I'd, ne I'd like to next invite Jean September, who currently works for the British Council, where she is the Deputy Director, South Africa, based in Cape Town. She is the strategic lead in developing and overseeing the education and society portfolio, a member of the child protection team, and an active contributor to the regional and global equality, diversity, and inclusion EDI agenda. Okay, Jean, would you like to come up? Thank you.
actually want to start by saying that when I think of education and I see quite a number of colleagues and comrades sitting in the audience here who I haven't seen for a very long time, is that, um, you know, the glass is always not half empty, but half full. So with all the challenges that we face in um, the South African education system, I think one needs, to, one needs to keep that hope alive because if there's no longer any hope, then, you know, we're not going to find solutions to any of the challenges that we, that we have. So working for a international um, organization like the British Council affords me the opportunity to actually to look at alternatives and see how, and being an educator myself for very many years, um, you may be out of the classroom, but the classroom is always in your head. It stays there, it doesn't matter what kind of work you do um, or where you are, that is on your shoulder all the time. So given an opportunity in the work that I do to influence what's happening in school education um, and also higher education and the TVET sector, um, in school education, when I started in the British Council, there was no school program at all. So over the years, we've developed one and um, we've created a program called Connecting Classrooms. And it's a global education program um, where we work in about sort of 40 countries around the world. But more specifically, what I work with are the teams in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have um, offices in about 23 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I try to look at what happens in education in those countries and connecting classrooms is one of our schools program, probably the biggest one, which we do with the Department for International Development, DFID, um, where we work with teachers, mainly in classroom practice, as well as with principals um, in a, another program where we um, promote instructional leadership. Given that principals are responsible for teaching and learning at their particular schools, and we know what the history of that is. Quite a lot of the principals that we do know sit in their offices. They do a lot of the admin work, make sure that the finances are okay at the school, that everybody's in the classes, but they don't actually go into the classrooms. They don't engage. So we've started a program around that. So this year, we've decided to take 50, class, um, 50 schools and um, take the principals who've all agreed to go through the program of instructional leadership with us, where they become responsible for teaching and learning in their schools and what role they need to play. It's not a new requirement. That requirement has always been there, but it's just never been practiced. And in each of those schools, we are taking the teachers through a set of, um, of core skills. Now, at the end of the day, it's the kids in the classrooms who matter. And if we want to prepare them to be um, citizens of the world, we want them to be prosperous, we want them to have jobs, we want them to have lives that, um, that they can imagine and be creative around as well. We need to work with our teachers specifically and our teachers are going to lead the kids into that. So quite a lot of our work is working with teachers and looking at continuous professional development for, for, for teachers. So the six core skills, um, we go through that with them. So it's a two-day workshop. 
and then the teachers go away for a period of 12 to 14 weeks where they practice a particular core skill, like, for example, critical thinking and problem solving. Um, questioning is one of those. How do you question in the classroom? Um, how do you begin to change your, your, your practice? And then they come back for one day after 12 weeks where they share what it is that they've done. And um, over the past sort of three years, they've created this community of practice where schools who are close to each other, um, the teachers meet, etc. And we think that is, we're taking it in small bites and um, we can't change the system um, overnight. So we work in these pockets and hopefully um, next year we will take another another 50 schools. So that's the one the one program that we're running. And the other one is the international partnerships, which we've been doing for the past 12 years, where we've been taking teachers and um, partnering them with um, teachers in other countries, in sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda, um, Mozambique, um, West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa, where there's something else that they can look for, you know, go and see what's happening in another country. And they then develop a project um, with that particular school for a period of three years. And they concentrate mainly on the um, SDG um, goals. Um, which also gives them an alternative. You know, they can look. They can look at something, and quite a lot of the teachers come back from their visits from sub-Saharan African countries, and they say, "We will never complain again." But that's soon forgotten. After a month, they're back to complaining. But I think it just gives them also another view. We also take students with. And this was a couple of years ago. We had primary schools going over to a school in, I think it was in, in Cardiff. And, um, and these 10 and 11 year olds um, had the time of their life going to, I mean, the first time even just going to the airport for, for one and getting on a plane and going somewhere. Um, where they've never been before. And there was one little boy who came back and reported. And he says, you know what? He spent five days in a class in, 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 in a school in Cardiff. And the teacher left the room. And there was absolute mayhem in the room. Kids were running on the desk, they were fighting, they were doing all sorts of things. But there was one little boy standing at the door and he was looking out for when the teacher comes. So, of course, he calls and he says, well, get back, and they all get back and they start working. The teacher obviously heard them down the hall, and she came back and she said, you know, okay, who was responsible? What happened here when I was? And none of the kids, and one little boy put his hand up and said, we misbehaved a little, but I was running on the desk and the others started to own up. But this little boy who comes from the school in Mannenberg said they all owned up, but the teacher didn't hit any of them. So he got up and he says, you know what? If this was in my class in Mannenberg, we would all have gotten five of the best. And here, the teacher had given them a task to do in terms of a little project, which was the punishment. And they all stayed for half an hour after school, and they did that. So he came back and he told this to the school where he comes from in an assembly one morning. The teachers were embarrassed when this boy told the story. But what the teachers didn't realize, that there's a resource at their school which can actually help them look at alternatives. And this little boy became the person who led 
those discussions at the school. Once we had gone back to the staff and, 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 and spoke to them and said, you know, make use of your students in the... In the so, so I think it's those little stories that gives one hope, you know, that um, how are we as teachers actually letting the students at school, whether at primary schools or whether at secondary schools, um, contribute in a meaningful way to some of the change that happens in the school. So I firmly believe, together with um, working with the Department of Basic Education, working also with the department here in this, in this province, the Western Cape Education Department. Harun is sitting here as well. We just completed last week a four-day workshop where we're looking at reading strategies and reading for meaning um, workshops that we're going to do with teachers and hopefully roll that out to the other, the other provinces as well. Um, we may be in a crisis, but I don't think we can throw our hands up and say, you know, we can't do anything. I think there's a lot of work to do, and maybe there should be a national campaign. Um, Sean, sitting here in front today, spoke about, you know, we all need to reboot. We all need to get our, our, um, our tackies back on again and not take to the streets, but look at what we can do in our own personal capacity in the schools in, in South Africa. So I am very hopeful about it, but I think we need to roll our sleeves up a little bit more and do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. You gave us some inspiring thoughts of how to broaden people's experiences, not only the teachers, but also the, the learners, and the importance of global context and connections. So our next speaker is Renee Farenfort. She ta has taught in schools before transitioning to adult basic education and training. And in 2001, she relocated to the United Kingdom, where she spent the next 12 years teaching in primary schools across five London boroughs. During this time, she was awarded the leading teacher status, chartered London teacher status, and was conferred the fellowship of the College of Teachers in 2010. She read for a master's degree in education at Brunel University in West London and is completing her research in South Africa. In 2013, she returned to South Africa to take up a position at the International School of Cape Town, where she's head of primary mathematics. She's a member of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. Renee's focus is multi multiple exceptionality in children when a child experiences high learning potential alongside a special educational need because of a learning difficulty or disability. She also has a keen interest in curriculum design. She's a premier author for the Times Education Supplement. She volunteers her time training staff that work in places of safety for young children on various aspects of teaching and learning. She also volunteers her time running workshops for children in the Hangberg and Massey Pumalela areas. She's currently working on content for a children's website. I don't think I need to turn over the page. That was quite a lot of information. So welcome, Rene, and we look forward to hearing your wisdom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a bit more intimidating than I had anticipated. Um, so let me just start by saying that my context is the primary school and um, I'm a very fierce advocate for primary school teachers because I feel that we get a very raw deal um, in terms of education. They even call what we do on a daily basis basic. <laughs> there is, let me tell you, nothing basic about teaching children that are just out of early years and just 
on their way to high school. There is nothing basic about what we do. So what I'd like to talk about, there are four areas that I'd like to talk about. And firstly, I think um, this is a very personal um, aspect that I bring to my practice. And it's something that I have developed over a course of very many years. And this is going from Groenvleit to Kriefgat to Garlandale to London and back again. Wherever I have worked, at the time I might not have been aware of um, what the children were experiencing or what I was experiencing, but a big part of that is trauma. And I think before we can teach children to read, to write, to calculate, we need to acknowledge, we need to identify, and we need to be aware of the trauma that, um, they, that the children bring with them to the classroom, that the children carry um, with them and in them. So you're thinking of what's going on in their heads and what's going on in their little hearts, um, which makes it possibly sound quite eerie fairy but trauma takes many forms. And this could go from the illness of a parent or a sibling or the child themselves to food insecurity, um, not having a place to stay, no place to call home, is a, is a very big thing um, in education. And when you cannot teach a child who's worried about what is going to happen when they get home, what has just happened before they left home, um, and what will happen because it's the weekend, because it's my weekend with my one parent or my other parent. So being a trauma-informed practitioner, a trauma-informed teacher that works in a trauma-informed school certainly does add value to what the children take from your practice because children come to school with the trauma, then there is the expectation for them to read, to write, to calculate, and they might have other issues intellectually or other issues that have gone unnoticed and unremediated as the minister at the weekend actually admitted that up until 15, there are massive gaps and they are, have not been remediated. So the children don't necessarily have a problem with mathematics, for example, or they don't necessarily have a problem with reading, writing, or spelling. There was just an issue that could have been addressed to show them how to do this differently. Um, and that leads on to teacher training, current um, teacher training. So I'm a product of UIT. I came through the old teacher training colleges. Um, and I don't feel that what I see with the students who come um, out into schools now, I don't feel that they are as aware of trauma of a child's emotional needs as well as of the intellectual needs. So earlier on when Sharon was talking about um, the amygdala and different functions of the brain, in the primary school we do this very simply. And when we teach them about mindfulness, about honesty, honesty in terms of addressing their feelings and their fears before there's fight or flight. We teach them about the shape of the brain, what happens in the different parts. But the mindfulness, we teach them that when you are honest, you're asking for help, and you just are going within. You are hugging your big feelings, which seems really simplistic. But to a very troubled eight or nine year old, who has just seen one of his parents or her parents being beaten by the other, bullets flying, there's not enough food. When you're hugging your feelings and somebody else shows an interest in hugging you, either physically or with their words and intentions, it makes a massive difference. And it's the one place where that child feels 
safe, safe enough to let go, to exhale, and to maybe listen. And I have to say maybe listen, because they listen a little bit more, they listen incrementally. They don't just sit, if you think of what we do in a primary school classroom, there's the perception that we have this image in our heads that children arrive at the door, they put their bags down, they go and sit down, take out their books, and they listen, and they are ready to learn. That's the textbook version, and that's the ideal. They come to school, there was a fight in the car. Sometimes it's just a fight between siblings. There was a fight in the car between parents, one parent maybe on the phone to the other. There were accidents along the way, violence, police sirens, all sorts of things. The puppy died, the granny's gone away. They're all sorts of things, they're all wanting to tell you this, but you need to start a maths lesson at eight o'clock. So there are other children also ready to learn, and it's a, it's a fine line to walk as a teacher, um, to honor the responsibility to all the children that are in front of you. But there's also acknowledging just that one child, because sometimes, most times, you are the only friendly face that child will see for the day. You are the only person who is going to use that child's name for the day. And when that child leaves you on a Friday, he or she might not hear his or her name in a warm, positive, reassuring way till Monday. And if you are absent, that cover teacher is not going to get a lot of cooperation. So being trauma-informed and being aware of a child's heart and mind and how to hug the big feelings and encouraging that child to hug those big feelings goes a long way to opening up a path where you are able to get through to that child where they understand the concept of numbers getting bigger and smaller and verbs and adjectives and so on. Then finally, it's just looking at um, the challenges that we face when we experience Expecting, we are expecting children to present in a certain way. So if a child doesn't write beautifully, can't sit up, has no core strength, as many children, the PlayStation and Xbox generation have, they've got a lot of skill here, and they have no core strength because they, safety reasons, parents working, they cannot sit still for a very long time teachers and other people around the child need to understand that you're not going to get a child to sit still. If the child cannot sit still, you don't get them to sit still by instructing them to sit still. They need to move more. So classrooms are very, need to be very busy places. And sometimes they can be quite um, annoying places for a teacher. Because you've got one kid bouncing up and down, some other one's walking around, something else is going, and then you just need to call it all back. Um, so it does become an ongoing learning path that we need to be following. We need to be learning about all those dysfunctions that children have, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, lack of attention, ADHD, inattention, and all of those are very different. But if we understand how to get the, the same result from a child in a different way, um, teaching can be very rewarding, tiring, frustrating while you're going, but it can be very rewarding. And this all links to a curriculum that needs to be relevant to the context in which the child lives and relevant to creating a global citizen from where you are in that school with that child. Global citizenship does not necessarily revolve around a school having technology and all the best resources. Yes, it helps, but um, we are an innovative bunch 
We are a creative bunch, most of us. Um, and with enough hard work and collaboration, because what has happened over time, just the way life has turned out for many of us, there's not, there are no communities of teachers where we can share ideas, we can share resources, we can share, we can just offload. Because teachers speak a special language, don't we? And so I think where we understand each other, where we understand the children, and the context helps us to bring out the best in every child because we can only change the world one child at a time. So, yes, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Renee. I'm pleased to see that you share my passion about trauma in the schools and its importance, and also the importance of the global connection. So I think we're starting to see some of the themes that are developing here. Burson Lesh, who's actually got his real book and not just the virtual book that I'm <laughs> promoting, has taught for eight years in Cape Town, and after obtaining his degree in education, he left to lecture at the Guiani College of Education in Limpopo. He thrived in the college environment where he developed more valuable teaching skills. In 2002, when colleges of education were to be closed down, he became both a facilitator at the Guiani Science Center and a curriculum advisor for the Mapani district. By 2004, all his colleagues from Guiani College joined him as curriculum advisors, serving 240 high schools in Mapani. For the next three years, they crisscrossed the district to train, monitor, and support over 500 teachers. After 11 years of working, living, and starting a family in Limpopo, Burson moved to Pretoria in 2007 to take up a post at the Department of Science and Technology in the Science and Youth Science Promotion Unit. He became a mentor to 60 undergrad students. He qualified as a certified professional resume writer and a certified professional career coach. He is a keen advisor on career development, the author of a book titled Dysfunctional Schools in South Africa, Reflections and a Turnaround Plan. So I'm very pleased to introduce Burson and to hear about his turnaround plan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Good evening, thanks uh, Sharon. I've got about 10 minutes and I'm gonna try and squeeze two and a half concepts into the t 10 minutes. The first topic I wanna talk to you about is the state of mind of our teachers. I believe our teachers are very lonely people. It's a very lonely profession in our country and my context is those schools that I worked with in Limpopo especially. Uh, teachers hide in the classrooms. They don't want anybody to get into the classrooms, not their colleagues, not their principals, not their curricul curriculum advisors. They are working on their own and struggling. And this leads to various things. I believe they are disheartened They've lost courage, they've lost self-confidence, and I actually believe they, they've actually kept walking around with a victim mentality. And in actual fact, it has become that the teacher is a spectator. The teacher is, because everybody's attacking them. Uh, universities are doing research and saying they don't do their work. Uh, industry saying the kids are not that are produced are not up to scratch, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and that means that the teachers are actually not in control of the classrooms. They're not in control of the curriculum. They're not in control of the uh, schools. Now, that may sound very negative, but let me ask you, and, and I'm going to give you a short story. I think you have many teachers here. Any, can you just maybe with a show of hands sh uh, tell me when you were a teacher, did you ever, ever take from home 
materials like a newspaper, a book, salt, sugar, potatoes, something like that to, for your lessons. And the school didn't know about it. You just did it as part of your professional responsibility. Can I just see with a show of hands? Now, you come from that culture of where you do that. We did that as teachers, right? Now, the world that I went to in Limpopo and those schools, it's just not there. I had a discussion with colleagues, and these are highly trained, educated people. And when I spoke, and I'm a biology teacher, about potatoes, you need two potatoes to do the osmosis experiment. You dig it out and you put in some salt or sugar. So, and then these people told me, no, you are getting into my budget, my home budget. And I thought, but people wake up teaching all over the world. You need to do this thing. But, and you can't expect the school to go buy two potatoes and one teaspoon of sugar. It, it's impossible. So, I am of the opinion that teachers are walking with this mentality, this victim mentality, where they are just uh, suffering. They, they're actually lonely people. And the m messages that we've heard now, and I'm going to now move to my second concept, and that is I believe that the solution to this all lies that teachers should actually form professional organizations, professional associations. A profession you belong to in South Africa, the South African Council for Educators, that's only for your registration and for discipline purposes. But how many professional organizations do we have for teachers in this country? Not the unions, it's not the union. A union does its own work. That is for uh, negotiating salaries, that's it. I'm talking about teachers getting together to share, to uh, share ideas, to plan together, to work together, to support one another, to motivate each other, right? And even start mentoring younger teachers in the group. Now that I believe is the major gap or a gap in the, in the system where teachers need to get together and one of the, yes, we are apparently known for Ubuntu, meaning working together and we work, live for each other, but it's not happening professionally in the teaching profession. It's only working in the union component, but not in the classroom. Otherwise, teachers are hiding and they're working alone. And the, these circles of care that you were talking about, that is what we need. So we are all talking the same language here. Teachers need to get together. And we need Ubuntu for professional development. We must be together. And then there's a modern concept. Uh, well, it's been around since the 1930s, but it's called the mastermind, where people get together, and there's a leader. And the group could be between 10, 20 people. Uh, and they meet regularly. But then once in a while, a member of the group, each member in the group of a mastermind, he, they say he or she is in the hot seat. And at that time, that person can now share with the group and say, this is my issues at at, in my profession. And for a teacher, it would be my classroom. These are my issues. And then the con collective wisdom of the group can then be, can be given to assist that teacher. And these are the ideas that we need to promote that teachers cannot continue working alone, uh, trying their utmost. They go to workshops, they go back, and they just don't change. They don't adopt new methods of improving things. So working together for mutual benefit, that is what it's all about. Earlier today, Jean was talking about how teachers were in the 90s here in, in the Cape Flats. Teachers got together and shared ideas on a Saturday. They and we, I was part of it in the biology group, where we changed the curriculum. We looked at the book, but we did our own thing. We interpreted the curriculum, and we did things to change the realities for the kids that we were teaching. So that's my second thought. And my last 
thought that I want to get to you or share with you is a very neglected topic is in the schooling sector is new teachers. Um, how do new teachers get into the profession? This is a big worrying factor because you can't expect a 20, this is the reality, a 22 year old to start his teaching career and teach, uh, in my time it was three subjects, so three top, it's these days probably five. Five, you must prepare five different lessons every day. So I believe that a proper internship is needed. That teachers from college, university, when they come, should be given three months and say, sit down and do your preparation. Write out all those lessons. Get them all organized so that when you walk into that school in January, you have your materials ready. And then you can get down to business because there are so many other issues that can distract you, that there's the sports here and this and that and other issues. But your curriculum, your materials already developed, your learning material, your teaching material. And that, I believe, is one of the ideas that I have also in my book that I share with uh, the community uh, tonight and in the country. So those are my thoughts. And yeah, closing thought, there is hope. Um, we need a shake up. The system needs a rebooting. That is the very word that I used, a rebooting of the system. Uh, some radical thoughts about how to reboot the system, but rebooting is needed. I thank you. Thank you, Bursten. I think um, what has become very evident is we all have a passion for the teaching profession and we believe in the teachers. When I go into the schools, I believe in those teachers, that they are the heroes, actually, and that they are not getting the recognition and the support that they need. And it's been interesting that every person is trying to support the teachers here rather than to just um, blame them for perhaps the state of the art of education. So, um, sorry. Oh, take it away. Um, I think it's your turn to say something. You've been sitting here very patiently. <laughs> I'm sure you have many views and opinions about what we have talked about here, and there's going to be a roving mic, and I really ask you to address whichever panelist you feel um, has spoken about some, a matter that's close to your heart, and please, let's open up the floor to what you feel needs to be discussed here. Thank you. Is, is somebody taking a roving mic around? Yes, there's the roving mic there. So please put up your hand if you would like to address one of the panelists. Okay. Well, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna work it, but <laughs> would you like to start then we'll move right. Oh. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Peter van Alf and I'm from Centre for Creative Education. Um, I'm very happy to hear all this, word, this uh, discussion around trauma and mm. children are not ready to mm. learn. Mm. Um, and for the approach that, I'm, that we are part of, we are really uh, concerned about the emotional well-being mm. of children. Mm. So when a child goes into a classroom, the teacher's main concern is intellectual development mm. and actually intellectual development can never be divorced from emotional development uh, sorry can you stand please i must oh. just ask you to stand thank All you right. so intellectual developments can never be and perhaps look divorced. at the camera thank you oh, okay. thank you <laughs> <laughs> intellectual development can never be divorced from emotional development now the one wonderful way of doing the two together, apart from the teacher's relationship, the teacher's relationship to the children is hugely important. Mm. It needs to be a positive, loving, caring kind of relationship. But apart from that, when a teacher starts to use the arts in the classroom, 
we have undervalued the arts hugely in the last mm. century and but more that if a ch child is painting or drawing or reciting a poem or in engaged in kind of dramatic, uh, some, something dramatic, then the emotional side of the child is engaged. And the learning with the head and the feeling with the heart are now joined together. And so a creative approach that teachers need to have will do a huge amount to start the healing process for our children. Thank you. Apparently, you don't have to look at the camera, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Would anybody in the panel like to talk about the creative side of, of teaching and the challenges, perhaps? For example, in Mannenberg, I was in a primary school where grade five, there were 53 learners in the class with a, a teacher, a teacher assistant, and apparently another assistant paid by the council, which was quite interesting. And this was a non-fee-paying school. So I'm just wondering about the practicalities of art, more art-directed work with such big numbers. You do have three teachers, which is, is um, perhaps helpful, but does anybody here have any experience of... Sorry? Oh, okay, we're going to take three or four questions and then we will answer those. Fine. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Hi, good evening. My name is Nikki. I'm an auxiliary social worker. I would like to ask a question. Everybody mentioned trauma and mm -hmm. kids and um, dysfunctional and dis special kids. But one special needs kids, we also um, sort of be misdiagnosed, especially in schools. Mm -hmm is our drug addict children, mm -hmm. where people say it's behavioral and it's not mm -hmm. medical. Mm -hmm. And it become a confusion and teachers mm -hmm. are not equipped to mm -hmm. identify mm -hmm. if it's a behavioral problem mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. just drug addiction and they don't mm -hmm. to distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. um, just how <coughs> can we, especially in our Cape, that's where it's very predominant that these things are happening mm -hmm. now. And within social development, it became, they only noticed that now it's been a been happening for a while and only be mm. it's like our government don't see the seed, they only see the the bigger fruit mm. is there that there's mm. a problem mm. and they don't interact with that mm. because now you have problems with teachers not identifying and kids mm. get shifted to the wrong places too. Mm. Special needs schools we don't really are not we teachers they are not even trained for that. So how mm. what advice mm. is there mm. for us working on the trenches as well mm. to deal with those type mm. of things mm. and to equip parents how to deal because there's also, also not enough resources for the kind of kids as well or special needs kids mm -hmm. resources schools as well mm. thank you okay, good evening to the panel um, uh, in the context of trauma um, there was a learner who did not hand in any assessments and uh, somehow I beg so many people, you know this guy, please try to find him, they got him. And when he came, he came down into the school court crying and crying and I was wondering why is he crying. And his mother was with him. And when they got near her, right in front of my face, I was traumatized to see the mother having a blue eye. And mm. I mean, that was her state, mm. which happened at home. Um, I feel that uh, I was also traumatized, so who, who was there to assist me? I mm. mean, I'm a machine, mm. or, you know, I've got feelings mm. as a human being. And then I found that the teacher, the, the principal, it's as if she's desensitized mm. to the social mm. circumstances mm. and because she appears to be able to handle it, she is fit for the job and so many others, mm. uh, you know, and previously the principal uh, apparently he passed away. I mean, and you know, just normal street words mm. says that yeah, he was stressed mm. because of. Mm. So my question, um, what, wh wh what is there for the teachers uh, uh, or is the is the real devil not the circuit manager sitting 
in the principal's office all day. You know, he gives instructions to the principal. Mm. It comes to break. You think it's a break when break is done and then we've got a meeting. We've got to listen to something. We've got to do it. Mm. And we supposedly must make changes. I don't know what the changes mm. is. So we being trained every day. Um, every morning we, we listen to the term plan. And so the psychology is, am I going to get this done? Mm. So Absolutely. at the end, when you come to the end of the term, as, as if it's a competition, are you done with your work already? Uh, did you do this already? Uh, is that done? So I feel it's a humdrum of instructions. So where am I going to get time for the arts? Mm. Because that's not relevant to what we must do. Mm. Where am I going to get time for psychology, for sessions, or, or for implementing something different or new? Because the, of the deadlines. Mm. And to be honest to you, to be honest to you, twice in my dreams, I had dreams of not handing in my work on time. And with that, you speak about se this lack of self-confidence. I mean, I mean, there was one teacher that others went to his house to help him complete his work and he wouldn't open the door mm. because he was completely so, uh, you know, traumatized. Mm. So, I mean, mm. I feel that's this whole systematic mm. doing mm. on top of each other mm. is uh, another, uh, another gangster or another bullet on itself, you know, by itself that, that actually mm. touches us mm. in the classroom, mm. in society, mm. and our day-to-day -day work, home, life, work, home, life. Thanks. Thank you very much for that very articulate description of what it is like to be a teacher and why you need support and why we are all sitting here today to try and help your circumstances and I think as Rene pointed out we need the systemic trauma-informed movement to take root, more root in schools that this is not just about a learner that is traumatized facing a teacher it's about the entire environment of where the teacher is working the conditions the expectations going right up into the Department of Education and everybody who's suffering from trauma there so I feel that this is a, a whole uh, the trauma is huge and it needs to take place at every level. It's not enough to just teach you in the classroom how to deal with that child. We have to help you too. And there are things in place like ICAS where teachers can seek help for their burnout. Um, but I don't think it's enough and I think teachers need to take charge with group groupings, professional groupings, circles of care, more discussions, getting that depersonalization that they suffer in their classrooms alone. We need to talk to each other and we need to share skills and help each other. So thank you for that very uh, impassioned plea of you are um, exposed to secondary trauma, you are seeing the mother with the, the, the wound on her face, the vicarious trauma is when you just get compassion fatigue. The headmistress you talked about, she can't feel anymore. There's too much going on uh, at too much of an emotional level. So I take your point about needing to bring in the arts, but it's almost like the teachers need to do the arts first just to get to a place that they can work with the arts because they are just so burnt out and exhausted. So I'm just commenting on your. Would the panel like to um, respond to any of the other questions that were asked in that round? What about, do you, any of you have experience with creativity and it's teaching the arts? There's a microphone there if you'd like to pick it up. Sorry? million and a place like Cuba gets 20 medals and the smaller countries and so on and we've we've um, the education department has scrapped music needlework 
I've had kids who are not academically inclined, but great with a needle, with a, with a paintbrush, and so on. But what about athletics, sport? I mean, kids used to play table, um, what tennis set at school. They played soccer, they played rugby, um, they ran. There's no athletics, I mean, and if there are athletics at school, it's not being judged properly. We don't have athletes coming through. You know, so mm -hmm. in a sense, the whole education department needs to rethink its strategy in mm -hmm. terms of the whole child. It's not just mm -hmm. about academics; mm -hmm. it's about music, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's about. Uh, I, I gave my kids uh, an, an uh, is, um, exercise one day, and I said to them, "Go home." They, most of them lived in Kewtan. Tell your mother to stand on the balcony and watch the sun go down, and ask her how she feels. And they thought I was mad. I probably mm. was. Because <laughs> that's who I am. I, and they came back on the following day and they said, Miss, my mother said she's never seen the sunset. So I said, every night she's there, there's a balcony. Tell her to go and sit on a mm. chair, make her a cup of tea, and let her watch the sunset. Then you ask her what she feels, write it down, and then I want to ask you how you feel about it. Now that's the kind of thing we don't do mm -hmm. because it's all about maths and mm -hmm. physics mm -hmm. and, and biology and so on. Mm -hmm. And we've lost the plot in terms mm -hmm. of our humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Department of Education needs to get back. It's humanity. Mm -hmm. So that we teach the whole child, mm -hmm. not just academics. Mm -hmm. But that sport, as far as I'm concerned, is critical. We fought this government mm -hmm. in the sporting arena. We took on, we took on the, the, the government in terms of, of, and we all became sporting, uh, um, sport f um, officials, starters, and so on. And that is where I think we need to go back to basics. Mm -hmm. Not uh, primary school education is not basic education, but go back to basics and get back our humanity. And mm -hmm. we need to address that to the Minister of mm -hmm. Education, mm -hmm. basic education as she calls it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that teachers need to get back to that humanity mm -hmm. because the mm -hmm. students, we're trying to teach the students and the, the, we can't teach them humanity if we don't have it ourselves. Mm, exactly. So I work at the, at the, I mean, I work with one-year-olds, but mm. the teachers that I'm working with don't have, they don't have a heart. And it's, it's very difficult for me because I'm trying to bring across that you need to teach with love. You mm. can't be shouting at the children. Mm. You can't be doing this. Mm. You need to let them play mm. outside. You need mm. to do this. And they're going, why? What is the point? Mm. We were brought up like this. Why, why do we have to do it differently? And uh, in uh, South Africa is changing. We mm. need, a, we need, you know, we need youth to, to, to come up. We, we need them to rise to the occasion. Because mm. at the moment, that's not possible. Mm. We're not giving them the chance to do that. Mm. Yeah. Sure. I think what you're talking about there is intergenerational trauma and the fact that violence and non-caring is norm normality. It's quite a few of the teachers say to me, when you know, if they had a stick in the cupboard, the child would say, Sir, get the stick, get the stick. They want the teacher to hit them. That's their, their reality. So where do we start with this whole caring, more creative, more compassionate approach? And how do we get that across to teachers? And in my book at the care center, it took about 20 years. The psychology unit was caring. The rest of the center was had very harsh discipline there. They had incarceration. The children were actually sent to cells, detention cells. And they were locked up if the teacher complained about them. And there's a, a section in my book where um, I'm talking about um, Professor Badruddin. Talk, he examined the Youth Care Centre's history and prefects punished students. And at one point, a prefect actually hits the, the finger off of a child standing in the line, getting hit by rulers. So we have a very... Um, traumatic history in South Africa with abused and neglected children, not just the justice children that needed the discipline. Everybody was shunted together. And your crime could be that you have a black mother and a white father and you ended up at that care center. 
and having your finger knocked off. So we, I think the depth of the trauma in South Africa hasn't been addressed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we are seeing the results of woundedness, which has come through from generations. And parents don't have the skills because that's all that they know. And we're trying to create a new way. And it took 20 or 30 years at that care centre for that mentality to go through because people would say, why must we change? It's working. Or they'd go back into the classroom, they'd learn the circle of courage, but they'd go back and do it the old way. And it's it has to become a trauma-informed system that everybody is on board with care because otherwise these pockets just continue in the classrooms and there's no real progress. Yeah. Would anybody else like to comment? I have the mic. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jackie. I am a teacher at Lavendale High School. So I am right in the middle of gangland. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it very much to be there at that school. I love my school. I love being there. And so when coming here tonight, I've been to so many discussions and forums and whatever where educational issues was discussed. I must say, this is the first time I'm coming to a forum where people are reminding me or telling me or just emphasizing that we need to acknowledge the trauma of the learners when they come to school in the morning. We talk about it like in drama style. We, we, we relate what has happened yesterday. Yesterday, like just yesterday, another child was killed in, in Lavendale, late there in the street and so on. So, so we talk about it in the drama style. So it's, it's about the detail and the drama around it. Um, but I think, um, yeah, with my school as it is now, we're also in the process of leadership change. Um, I am in the fortunate position where I am in that leadership circle so with this leadership change, I see a golden opportunity for rebooting, and I am so ready for that mm -hmm. rebooting. Um, so it is very encouraging for me to hear that there is a circle of care, um, that schools get selected. I would like to know tonight, how can my school be selected? How can my school become part of that? I would also like to know um, the question that I have is, how do I access the services that have been mentioned here tonight? And how do I access it in a sustainable manner? Because we have mm -hmm. the situation where, you know, shooting happens, children can't come to school, we go back, and then there's a psychologist from the department for one, one hour session. You guys seem to be okay now. Um, we are not okay. We cannot, um, I've been asking just so on a spiritual level, I've been asking the universe to, to, to help me, to find ways, to find means of doing this because I feel like so many have said here tonight that we have become, this, we have become disjointed from where they are at and where we are mm -hmm. at. We are in fight and flight mode every mm -hmm. day. And we need to get in touch with ourselves and also get in touch with them. I'm ready to reboot. I'd like to be a part of the change mm -hmm. that comes about in this education system. Mm -hmm. I have committed myself to that. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking that being in this circle here tonight, if each one of us, I think, can go back to where we come from with just saying, I am ready to reboot the universe will make it possible for you tomorrow to change or to touch just one more colleague at your school. And that is how we, how we bring the change about at our schools. So I would like to have access, please, to the services. I would like to have it in a sustainable manner, and I'm ready to reboot my school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Stemray, uh, an ex 
teacher of 23 years. Uh, in the good old struggle days, we had the slogan, the people shall govern. The people shout now, and the governors are not listening to the people. And I think that's one of the problems. I think another one of the problems are that the planners of our education, uh, they've never spent a single year or two teaching the primary school or the high school. He went to university, he became a researcher, and now he's co-opted by the government and he is an expert in his field. With that, um, we must have and get through all our assessments. Ten assessments, we must get through the assessments. Whether the child understands the work or not, we must complete the assessments because we must punch in those marks. Um, one of the things that I love doing at the end of standard five or grade seven, you go with me up Table Mountain. Yeah. And the kids looked forward to that. He's in standard three, grade five, and he hears that Lish takes the standard fives up Table Mountain. And the kids look forward to that. But we don't have time for that because the assessments must be done. We must complete the assessments. So I think those are some of the things that we need to address. And the last point, uh, and this I'd like the panelists to give a, a thought to. Should we resurrect the old Hewitts? Yes. Yes. <laughs> because I think uh, they taught, the lecturers taught us values. And those core values we took into the classroom. Yes. And uh, with all due respect to the lecturers at universities who are in education faculties, with all due respect to them, um, I don't think that those core values that we were taught are being conveyed to the young teachers so that they become people with compassion, empathy, and sympathy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm one of those staff members from Stellenbosch University that you are speaking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yes, and I fully agree agree with what the speaker has uh, said there. I remember Jonathan Jansen when he launched one of his books some time ago. He said that uh, BE it courses, what the university is doing, is completely failing. Uh, so yes, you are right. You are right. But one thing that universities and teachers and schools are failing in, Paulo Freire talks about Concentrazazo. We are not concentrizing young mm -hmm. teachers anymore about the political situation. Mm -hmm. Are we surprised that our schools are finding themselves in this kind of situation, what they are in? Our schools are products of the colonial and the apartheid mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. We did not have a decolonizing. Mm -hmm thing mm. in 1994. Mm. Walter McNolo says when transformation happens one or two things can occur. Either the incoming new government changes completely or they take over some of the things of the past and continue with some of the things of the past. Our education system that we had was not a decolonizing education system. We could almost expect this when the SACOS 
walked out of the discussion meetings, they said, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, we're going to find our school sport is going to be in a mess, which it mm. is right now. Mm. So teachers and the education department and those in power are failing us mm. because they are not politically conscientizing young people mm. on the root causes of why we are finding ourselves mm. in this mess that we're in mm. now. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much to you panelists there. I uh, was listening when you were addressing some problems teachers are facing with. But um, I believe what we are saying here is quite good. But the problem is bigger than that. One, the problem in education is not the curriculum and all fine trauma is part of it. But the biggest problem that is there, we had, we're sitting with a system with the, the calibre of teachers that are there, the, the new generation of teachers that are there. These teachers that are there, one, they have not been mentored. They lack mentorship. Two, the good teachers have left the system and the bad teachers came in. Why I'm saying that? While I was in the school in the Kazakh and for more than 20 years, we were doing all the art. We were taking a student to the river because I was a science teacher, when I, I have to teach about a photosynthesis, I have to take, uh, I mean, student out of the classroom. But when the promotion comes into the school, they will promote a bad teacher who comes late to school because he's a union member. And then the, the, the good teachers were frustrated and left the system. Now, let us face the truth. What is happening now is what they have been cooking from 1994. Fortunately, I was there. In 1994, we told them that OPE is not going to uh, I mean, work in South Africa. But the politicians, they, they implemented it. And they, they were on us. They used to come to my classroom. And I told them that I have 60 uh, learners in the classroom. This thing can't work. But they implemented things that they knew very well that those things, they're not good. That, that is where we are now. But that thing, that trouble started in 1994. So we were frustrated and we left the system. The teachers that are there, I am telling you, one, they have no values. They have no ethics. So the good teachers, they, they, they never took care of them. They never appreciated them. The college trained teachers, they were, they, were, they were abandoned by the system. And now we are sitting over a time bomb. You can talk about trauma, you can talk about anything, but I'm telling you, the kind, the calibre of teachers that we have in our education system, I'm afraid in the next 10 years or 20 years to come, if I, I, I'm not in the grave that year, we'll be talking about the same problems because the politicians, they don't want to change things. They, they talk about things, they talk about legislation, they talk the white paper, the green paper, the, the, the yellow paper, but when you go to the practicality, you go to the classroom, you still find teachers with 60 learners, one teacher, you still find, after these 25 years of democracy, you still find teachers, schools, with no library, no paper, no, no, no machine, photocopying machine. Then what teachers are, are going to do? That's why teachers are stressed and traumatized. And fortunately, I'm coming from that environment. 
uh, if you look at KZN, Eastern Cape and Limpompo, you will see the challenges teachers are facing with every day. So with those challenges, how can you get a good teacher who is always traumatized every day? The department is saying things, the parents are saying things, learners, they don't want to do homework, they don't want, and no one is, but when the, when the, when the child fails, the teacher has to write a report why that child failed. But when the child is coming late, no one cares. When the child is not doing homework, no one cares. I'm coming from an environment. I was totally frustrated. So if the Department of Education doesn't want to address the core things, if the parents, they don't want to come to the party, and then they, they, they lay all the burden on teachers, hey, 25 years, we are still going to sit with these problems that we are talking about. We need the Department of Education, the people who are going to bring the revolution. Not people who are going to enjoy sit and talk a lot. We don't need talkers, people who are going to talk and talk and talk. We need people who are going to bring this report that you are talking about. But at the present moment, we're sitting with people who are enjoying positions. They don't care about what is happening in schools. They don't even go to those schools and see what kind of support those schools need. So that is the problem that we are sitting in uh, in South Africa at the present moment. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is um, Abdurrah Auf Reklif. I am married to a teacher, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> I was also a pupil back in the day. So I've got that experience. <laughs> I was a school social worker at WCED for a short while. And so I really appreciate the talk about trauma. The ratio was one is to 20,000 learners when I was a school show, social worker. Just to give an idea of the challenges we had. And now I'm serving on the school governing body of, um, of the school where one of my children are attending. So I've got a like a really cool view about the education system. And I must want to say, um, I don't agree with the previous speaker about all these bad teachers coming in. I think there are some bad teachers that came in. To generalize it like that, I'm, I'm not supportive of that. Because I do see a lot of good teachers doing a lot of good work, and especially from the SGB's point of view. I also appreciate the sports comment. I mean, one of the things I'm struggling with is, why am I paying for coaches on the SGB? Back in the day, my teacher taught me how to play soccer or volleyball, or whatever mm -hmm. it was. So those are that previous culture you were talking mm -hmm. about there, sir. But the point I really want to come to is 1985, I was in primary school. State of emergency was called. They shut the schools down. Can you remember that? Mm. My parents, along with other parents, didn't stand for this. We went to the school and we demanded for that school to be opened. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, I attended Livingston High School and I think I see one of my teachers or a couple of my previous teachers here. And in 1992 or 93, they can correct me on the date, there was some restructuring and they took some of our teachers or they planned to take some of our teachers away. As a result, the school mobilized and we all went to the department in town, parents, learners, as well as teachers, and we did a toy toy thing. The outcome of that is some of our parents and our teachers, my mom was part of that, were actually arrested. And then later on, we met the education department again and they didn't remove that teacher. And so the point, I'm, the question I want to ask is, because a lot of these problems are political, as the gentleman said there, they're systemic, policy, and they're structural. The question mm -hmm. I'm asking is, when are teachers going to reach the hot pole threshold mm -hmm. of where we're actually going to stand up and take on the things that is making it very difficult for us to progress in terms of education? Thank you. Pardon? See, sorry. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tiara Pathan. Um, I'm not a teacher. I'm going to speak um, from my experience as a parent. Um, 
I matriculated in 1992 from Garlandale. I'm a product of Bantu education, Abdura of. Um, and I always tell people I think I had the best education ever. I'm sure anyone sitting in this room would agree with me. And now my partner and I have five kids between us and we've gone through OBE and CAPS and the parents doing the homework. And I'm hello frustrated and um, I'm fearful for my kids. So we, between us, it's a 20 year old and the last light lamaki is nine. Um, and I don't know what the state of this education is gonna do for him. Um, to the point that we've even considered homeschooling him because I think I can teach him better. You know, I think I have more patience. Um, in fact, I do teach him some of the maths, long division methods that we used to do and algebra and those kind of things that I can remember. Um, but recently, in the last two weeks, um, the buzz is that our kids are gonna exit at grade nine um, into three streams, academic, uh, vocational, and technical, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm very interested to hear what the panel has to say and what their thoughts are in terms of it. I mean, I must say I've done some of the reading and on the, I'm, I'm two-sided, could be a very good idea. Um, you know, um, it could be great for our youth, but what if they don't take one of those pathways and they exit at grade nine and then what? Mm. Um, you know, we've shortened their 12 years of education. Prof, I'm, I'm yeah. particularly interested in what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Okay, we are starting to come to the end of the session, so I'm going to allow the panelists to comment. Thank you for your comments, and um, we can carry on chatting afterwards if you feel like you would like to engage more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yes. Did you know that? They mm. fail. Mm. So my husband says he's teaching a grade 9 class, 9E, that um, they just don't listen to him because he, they, they're going to pass at the end of the year. Mm. So mm. within these phases, the three, what's it again? Four mm. to, s give it to me, seven, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, and then 10 and 11. So within three standards, they can only fail once, mm. and then they get moved on. Mm. So. If they fail once, they move on. Mm. So you're going to have kids in grade 12 who haven't passed since grade six, mm. but they move on. Yeah. And that, the, that is the metric results that people brag about, mm. you see? So in a sense, there's that too. And mm. th there, there are many more issues which, which we can raise mm. here tonight. Mm. But I think it, it was a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start, John? Thank you. So uh, maybe I should start with, with the questions at the end. Uh, but, but let me just say that I agree that uh, with some of the speakers that we need to be able to speak. We need to earn the right to speak about what's happening in our schools. I spent five years. Uh, before I went overseas as a teacher uh, uh, in the classroom, both in Belgravia, where I was, and Hanover Park, where I was almost killed. But, so I earned my stripes in, in that sense. So, uh, but I do think um, the, the, uh, there's a very big difference uh, between the public schools and the independent schools. As Umalusi, I go around handing out certificates uh, to the independent schools, of which there are 2,000 or so. But the rest of the, of the, of the country, public schools. And the problem with, to get an accreditation from Uma Lucy, you need to jump through many, many hoops. You need to show that you're taking teaching and learning seriously. But if you're in a public school, you are deemed accredited. Now, that's a policy that I think is problematic. So they can do whatever they want. I was also head of NIDU. In other words, I was the Inspector General. 
The last time there was an inspector in the class in this country was 1989. Since 1989 till now, there's been no supervision, no accountability. Uh, I, I can, I, I'm just checking my impulse to go on about that. So let me jump to your question about the grade nine because I have to give uh, a panel. You know, I, I have to say this because you'll find out I've got to go to a function now and it's for me very sad that my daughter, my oldest daughter with her, her child and her husband, I'm going to a function now where they're saying goodbye to this country. And as much as I want to stop them, what do I have to offer? Uh, they're going back to Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, where I lived for 10 years. Uh, I won't leave here. But they're Americans. They, they, you know, they just took their passports and left. But um, the, the problem is that um, uh, the, the, the National Senior Certificate or the Matric Certificate is a whole, it's a whole qualification. What that means, and I'm coming to this grade nine issue, what that means, you can spend 11 years at school and nine months. And if you drop out, you get zero, nothing. That's a problem. So, and even if you write the exam, 720,000 will write this year. And even if 80% passes, there's still 150,000 that walk with nothing. And they are discouraged, they won't go back. So, it is one argument to say, should we not get them something uh, to fall back on? Uh, well, let me just say this, this, uh, you, uh, my sister went through JC and then from there she went, you know, there, a lot of people had went through to JC. Did we speak about that as lowering standards? You know, you remember the JC? Yeah. No, yeah. So we are not saying that the JC will replace the, the SC, right? So what I'm saying is, I, I had slides here, but you know, I didn't have time to show you. Those people that are not in education, not in training, not in employment, is three million. And those are the people that create problems in our social fabric. Because they feel worthless, they don't have anything to show. So that's one argument. Of course, I can argue the other way as well. But I'm just putting on the table reasons why I believe there's merit in considering an, an exit. Now, maybe the minister didn't communicate this properly. So you tried to, to explain the phases. So there, there are four phases. So the foundation phase, the intermediate phase, the senior phase. Yeah. That's the end of the compulsory education. Then you can go to further education, which is not compulsory. And then you can do grades 10, 11, and 12. That's FET phase. So at each phase you exit. So the exit, the grade nine exit, is the exit of the senior phase. That's all it is. It's not the exit out of the school system. And that's where teachers like yourself and others must educate people so that you just have a marker that you've achieved these outcomes at this point. Mm -hmm. And you can show that through a s systemic assessment which is called the GEC. By the way, they will do it. Uma Lucy won't do that. Uma Lucy does the senior certificate. But uh, they will do it with online uh, instant marking, uh, pre-moderated uh, pre papers. So it will be online, just a, a normal assessment. Uh, I can tell you, running an exam in this country for one year, if I ask you to guess how much it costs, we don't pay for it, Uma Lucy doesn't pay for it. To run an exam is 5.6 billion. Hmm. 5.6 billion rand for one year with the supplementary exam. So I, I think that um, I am uh, not completing my argument with this, but all I'm saying is I see a lot of merit in taking the grade nine. I think it's just poorly, uh, uh, poorly communicated. And it's not the issue of leaving the school. You're exiting the senior phase. 
you're exiting, and then you, then you have a choice. And teachers like yourselves must begin to say, now you have a choice. Mm. You can go academic, you can go vocational, you can go technical. Mm. And, but you need a grade nine to do that. Mm. You can't go overseas. Well, why not? Excuse me? But why would you want to go overseas? No, I'm just saying that uh, the qualification is not a qualification that will be internationally recognized. But uh, apart from that, we are lowering standards. We need to set a benchmark and reach for that. That's what we fought for in this country. We fought for certain standards to be reached. Grade 12 with uh, tertiary education and going to, to wherever. Now we say grade 9. Do whatever you like, you can go work. No, that is not what it's being said. No, no, I think you missed. You see, you're, you're buying into a narrative that's not correct. Okay. And I don't have time to correct you right now. So I think we'll just leave it like that. Okay, thank you. You know, as I, as I sit here, I'm thinking about when last have we ever had a gathering of, of teachers and people interested in education talking about education. And I don't think we've had a gathering like this in many, many years where we can actually share our own thoughts with each other. And maybe to take, to take away with us in the 70s, the 80s, well, even the 60s, the 90s, there was a lot of teacher agency in this country. And the question I want to leave everybody with is, what's happened to that agency? And I saw glimmers of it here today. Um, mm -hmm. The woman who spoke here was a teacher and the other one who spoke there as well. How do you galvanize the kind of things that you were talking about that affects you in the classroom now. So I think quite a number of us sitting here aren't in the classroom anymore. And it definitely has changed. The classroom is a different place now than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I think we need to acknowledge it. what is that what does that agency look like? What is it as a young teacher that you need in order to do your job even better in the classroom? And we need to hear more of that, of that voice. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful that, that some of the um, young teachers spoke out as well. Um. I'm still really um, passionate about the fact that primary school education informs, supports, and underpins that age 15 <coughs> exit, not into the real world, but into other forms of training. And if we don't get it right from the day the child starts school, at whatever age they are, they will have or continue to have the deficits, the dysfunctions, the low self-esteem, and the lack, the poverty of aspiration. Mm -hmm. Because with all of that, you do think, why bother? So there's poverty of aspiration, as well as other types of poverty and the social degradation that comes with that. Um, and I think that we need to move away from the, I'm a prolific Facebooker and Instagrammer, so we need to move away from the hashtags. That, that 21st century learning is more than just a hashtag. It is the world that we are going to inhabit. It is the world that we are currently inhabiting. If we don't have a vision for what the world needs to look like and impart that to the children and offer them choices in terms of behavior, in terms of ethics, and so on, we will be stuck with the kind of um, model decline that 
we currently are faced with. So I would like um, to possibly to speak to Noel about keeping the dialogue, keeping the discussion going, because this is very, very inspiring. It's very encouraging. And I do think that teachers need to share. We, we don't share often enough, and that's not necessarily born out of selfishness. It's life. And I think if we could make the time here today and keep this going, uh, good things will come from that. But I am mm. here to fight the primary school cause, not the basic education <laughs> cause. <laughs> Thank you. Just two closing thoughts. I love the concept of this uh, old uh, child development and the mentioning that we've lost humanity in teaching. The point is that many, many learners in the schooling system require and need sport, music, arts, debates, and these things to actually give them confidence. And they, when they start excelling in these other issues, their schoolwork will benefit. And it's that confidence that we need to get. And uh, yeah, so that's my one point. And the other point I want to make I also disagree with the concept that we have weak or bad teachers uh, or lazy and stupid teachers, which the research is saying. I really believe our teachers maybe are not the most sophisticated people, but they have, they have the drive. They just need assistance, and they need to be given a platform where they can take control back take control of, of themselves, of their classrooms, of their schools and their profession. At the moment, they are spectators and they need to get that back, that agency that uh, Jean is talking about. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, I have to, I have to say something here. Can I maybe feel that we maybe retract a statement that teachers are not sophisticated? I think our teachers that we have are probably mm -hmm. are the most sophisticated people mm -hmm that we have because those were the ones that conscientized us. Mm. Um, so maybe, uh, may, may, maybe you okay. just see the incorrect word, I think. Mm. Okay. But uh, just on that point, I don't think our teachers are not sophisticated. Okay, mm. okay. Mm. Thank you. Would you like to? The context, sorry, that I am referring to are the teachers that I, as I introduced myself, I'm referring to the schools, the teachers that I worked with in Limpopo. I'm not referring to the Cape Flats and the schools that you, this group of people, are uh, referring yeah. to. So I, uh, that was my context in a different okay. world. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Um, as you spoke, I thought about schools where I'm working, where values are important, where prayers are said, where there is an emphasis on sport or arts. So some people are getting it right. They are. I've, I have a vision that we can start a, a information centre for teachers. That that's that is working in this school, and I'm doing rap in the mornings, and I'm dancing, and I'm. You know, you, there are just so many wonderful things out there, and we need to be sharing it. We're a global world now. with We have access to information. So after I've finished training in all these schools, I'm going to gather all this information together and try and create a platform of information where people can access this and that you don't feel isolated in your pockets. And I thank think you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, but past seven, we book the venue until eight. Um, so I'm encouraging you to please stay because there's more wine, there's drink, there is uh, <laughs> there's snacks. <laughs> we want you to talk to each other. Because the idea is the idea is that you need to talk Sorry? to each other. But let me just say a couple of things in closure. I think it's very important. A lot of what's been um, said here today is opinion, right? People expressing their opinion, voicing what they think about education and the system and what's going on and how we understand it. I'm asking you, and I'm appealing to you, to write your thoughts down in opinion pieces. Send your opinion pieces to us. Zenat Norton, sitting at the back, is our marketing manager. Wave at them, Zenat. Where's that? <laughs> Don't you see where? 
Sandy Seaweed here. There she's at the back. Talk to her. She will take those um, opinion pieces that you write. She'll edit them and she'll publish them in the newspaper. And your opinions will then be amplified. We'll put a megaphone to your opinions because we have a partnership with the Argus. And the Argus prints op-eds. I really would like to invite all our panelists to take what you have contributed tonight and to write it up for us. It doesn't have to be long. Sharon's already done it. If Sharon can do it, you can do it. <laughs> write up what you shared with us tonight and we will publish it in the weekend August. We're also doing an amazing project with The Daily Voice where we're encouraging people to highlight the issues that they deal with on a daily basis in their communities that we know is the underbelly of what's happened in our society and to highlight that, to propose solutions, and then to enter a competition where they can win a, a bursary to come and study at Cornerstone, to come and study community development. And uh, our community development lecturer, she's sitting over there, her name is Rene, wave at them, Rene, and encourage them to come and study community development with us. Couple of things quickly, hot coffee. Thank you very much. Hot coffee. As we should have warned you in advance, but they've uh, been streaming this conversation live. So it's been going out on social media globally, and they'll be able to tell us later how many people tuned in to the conversation. Oh, wow. Well, if you had gone onto our notices, it's seen at the bottom of the notices that the conversation is live streamed and recorded, and then we take the conversation and we broadcast it on Bush Radio. So tune in to Bush Radio on the 28th and 29th between 3 and 4, Sandy Siwe? 3 and 4? 2 and 3. 2 and 3, and then that to the 28th and 29th, we broadcast the conversation. Then Daphne, I would like to invite you on the 30th between 2 and 3 to comment on what happened here today live on Bush Radio. And Daphne is said yes. Okay. But now, Daphne, you must make sure you get your facts straight, okay? <laughs> because you must remember that you, you were in the classroom X number of years ago. So let's also make it a lively, vibrant panel where people challenge one another. Because then I think it makes for lively uh, listenership. People want to hear different opinions. We mustn't all be the same. It's not about us being the same, okay? It will also, the conversation has been filmed. You could see that. It's going to be uh, put on our YouTube channel, it's on our website. Um, and just give me one more opportunity. Everybody spoke about reclaiming agency, Janine. I need you to just come and say one or two words about our event in November 7, 8, and 9th. The event is about reclaiming agency. And Janine is the organizer of that event, and she's going to give us a quick input on what that event is about. Just a quick one or two sentences. Hi, everyone. So Reclaiming Agency will take place from the evening of the 7th of November, which is also a first Thursday, through to the evening of the 9th of November. Um, we're opening it up with the heritage tour of Boo Cup, and then we're having our um, opening session at Community Chest in Bree Street. On the Friday morning, which is really important for everyone sitting here, at half past 10 on the 8th of November, we are actually having a workshop, a dialogue on teachers reclaiming agencies. So all of you are more than welcome to attend that session. And we, if you signed up, um, RSVP'd, or signed in with the registration desk, you will all be informed of the broader program is, as well, which includes issues of professionalizing community development, um, the geopolitical landscape of Cape Town, especially the CBD, so Zona Bloom, District 6 Book Up, um, and just various ways that the youth are also attempting to reclaim our agency as Cape Townians, but also as South Africans. Cool. Thank you, and we end that with a party at the, um, the Daily Music Show on the Saturday evening. So we will send you all the information. I can't thank the panelists enough. This has been a most interesting panel, because the panel hardly spoke 
The facilitators <laughs> spoke a lot, but mostly the audience spoke. You were so participative. And I want to take my hat off to the panelists for, uh, for once, sitting, listening, and giving the audience more of an opportunity to speak. So a huge thanks to you. A huge thanks to the Cornerstone team. You've done a great job of putting this event together. And people, this event closes tonight, and I'm asking you to hang around with the launch of this book. Okay? This functional schools in South Africa reflection and a turnaround plan. And the writer is sitting right here. Okay? And the book is going for 150 Rand. We've got credit card facilities. And Person Lish, the writer, will be sitting in that chair and signing your copy. So don't forget to get your copy and to leave tonight with a souvenir signed by one of our own local writers putting stories out there in the way that we're asking you all to do. So, person will be coming back. As you heard, he worked with the Department of Science and Technology. He'll be coming back on the 30th of November. It's a Saturday. He'll be, run, be running a careers day for us here with, uh, with some uh, of his colleagues from the department, and we're inviting mainly life orientation teachers, grade 12, as well as leadership of grade 11 to come and be part of that event on the 30th of November. So, as I said, please stay, don't go home. We will hang out, have a good night, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you.